All right, let's get back to the magnificent and infinite mysteries of the ethereal plane, shall we? I asked you to provide questions I could answer on this video, and you did not leave me hanging, so clearing up some questions about the ethereal realm. Number one, I have to apologize. I did mess up something very important in my last video on the subject, and that is the separation of the ethereal plane with the so-called outer planes. This is the general rule. The astral plane connects to those spiritual realms, linking to them directly via color pools. I have mentioned that the realm of dreams, a specific example of a plane that exists both on the ethereal and on the astral plane, you see, specific examples always override general rules in Dungeons and Dragons, so there are exceptions to the general rule. Some major portals can ignore this rule, and some teleportation magic can be employed as well. You can't get to the interplanar city of Sigil via the astral plane, nor can you reach it or the outlands via the ethereal plane. The ethereal plane connects only with the prime material plane, demi planes, and all of the elemental planes. That is all. It's a lot, but that is all. That being said, since portal magic can mess with any of these restrictions, it can be more safe and efficient to use the ethereal plane to get around undetected and go from there to the prime or inner plane, and from there, use a portal to reach another location. Just to make it absolutely clear, you cannot get to the outer planes directly via the ethereal, but it is easier to get around from the ethereal in general, which is why so many planar powers use it. And it is so amazingly ancient that there's a better than zero chance you could stumble across some ancient sort of Stargate network and have it all to yourself, which can be an incredible advantage for any number of reasons. No border ethereal zone exists around any of the outer planes, including the Nine Hells and even the Abyss, certainly not Celestia or Hades and so on. Now, being cut off from the outer planes, naturally, Clerics and Paladins should have some concerns, we'll talk about that in a second, and to a lesser extent, Warlocks might have some worries that they're going to get cut off from their source of power. However, it's a mistake to assume that a power a patron grants a Warlock comes directly from that patron. Actually, quite often, the patron uses the Warlock to access power that they could not, and through their Warlocks, they glean some of that power for themselves. So you see, there are very good reasons above and beyond gaining a soul or a service that a power would become a patron. Actually, becoming a patron may be a very necessary step for a being to become a power. Kind of like how astral entities become powers by gaining worshippers. The astral plane runs on thought, so naturally the more attention an astral entity can draw to itself, the more power it gains on the astral plane. This could be quite a shock to warlocks when they find out that their patron may seem to be going above and beyond to protect them, but personally be way less formidable than they assumed they were. The warlock is actually the vital key to their power. Losing the warlock could wind them up in a fate worse than death. That's why warlock is one of my favorite classes. Alongside cleric, the background and specifics of the relationship between the power and the agent of that power has limitless potential for your creativity. But I digress. What happens when a spellcaster who relies on a divine source is cut off from that source? Well, traditionally, it's not like a switch is turned off and they lose all their spellcasting powers. The general rule is that being cut off from the source of their power just limits the spellcaster to casting spells of a level below that which requires direct connection to their god. At least, this has been specified in older editions. And as we know, 5th edition is very reluctant to nerf any player character class feature like this. If you want to impose problems, the first is that divination spells are just going to fizzle when a clerical paladin attempts to cast them on the ethereal plane, and they're probably not going to be able to cast spells of their highest attained level. The old rule is that when a cleric character is on a plane other than where their god resides, all that cleric spellcasting power is reduced for every plane between themselves and their god's home plane. So each plane between the cleric and the deity's home plane, the cleric's effective casting level for this divine spells is reduced by one. Furthermore, you could have it so that each separating plane, the cleric loses one prepared spell slot of the highest level of the player's choice. For 5th edition, you are free to ignore that if you like. However, when a cleric is traveling around a plane of existence, home to a deity that is directly in opposition to their own god, that little rule is a good one to spring on them. They lose any home field advantage because they are very much so in enemy territory. So the god that they are praying to and gaining 
spells from doesn't want them disrupting the status quo by acting as an enemy agent in, you know, quite a delicate situation. The effects of all magic within the ethereal plane can be very important, particularly conjuration and illusion, which is understandably where the bulk of the viewer questions concentrated. And I have good news and bad news. The good news is that the reduced need for concentration is quite true. However, the bad news is that I neglected to mention the element of chaos involved in illusionary objects that suddenly manifest for real in the ethereal plane. So let's talk about that for a moment. The ethereal plane houses the prime material plane, all of it. So all of the crystal spheres and all of the phlogiston. It may help to think of the phlogiston as the flip side of the ethereal mists. You're looking at the protomatter mists of the ethereal emanating from the elemental planes like some sort of cosmic wind. From the prime, it looks like rainbow nebula gas. Interacting with it can be very dangerous because it can't manifest as matter in the prime material plane. It can, however, release some of its potential energy, which is explosive. So this is why phlogiston gas seems to be able to burn without oxygen. It also makes more sense why it can't be brought into a crystal sphere. It's the exact same reason why you can't pull the deep ethereal directly into the prime material plane or into a demiplane. Attempting to do so means pulling or pushing against the entire power of the color curtain, the realm of dreams, the entire astral plane and so on. It's insurmountable. I mean, just try turning an inflated rubber balloon inside out just using your fingertips. It can't be done. The ethereal plane is full of mists of elemental energy. Ripples and shockwaves through this medium naturally and spontaneously compress the mists to form protomatter clumps, and there is a normal accretion of massive whirlpools of mist to form natural demiplanes, which become more and more solid and real, and eventually, by some process, they pop out from one side of the rubber balloon of the <laughs> ethereal to the other and emerge into the prime material plane as crystal spheres with their own border ethereal zone surrounded by the phlogiston gas. This is the structure of the prime material plane as we see in this image here. So creating demiplanes is just manipulation of a normal process in many ways. It's just a set of dimensional laws and physics. It can be calculated, formulated and taught. So conjuration, teleportation, transmutation and force magic may be some of the oldest basic magic technologies that emerged from just very clever beings observing natural cosmic processes. Of course, earlier than that would be just purely elemental magic. Okay, so when on the ethereal plane, that potential for the mists to become matter is a constant factor. And when a being casts an illusion, it causes a ripple. It creates a template that protomatter can lock onto. And the result is, unfortunately, far from entirely predictable. I mean, where would be the fun in that? Others have already described the qualities of ethereal substance quite well. I'll talk about it a little bit as well. There may also be names for it like protomatter or contestants and so on, but I prefer to call it ectoplasm most of the time, and it has a lot of interesting qualities. I'll mainly be quoting directly from Bruce Cordell and the Guide to the Ethereal Plane here, but with some hints and bits from wiki pages off the beaten track a bit. And sorry for those of you who love the Planescape jargon, I don't love it, so I'll be quoting without the bloods and cutters and burks and all that planescape slang. Sorry. At the best of times, the vision of a character extends about 300 feet through the swirling ethereal vapors. Although murky shapes, bulges and ripples can be seen beyond, a character can see into the material plane from any point on the border ethereal. This is something like peering through a cracked and dirty pane of glass. Um, from some angles, the material world can be seen clearly. From others, it's distorted and warped out of all proportion, and from yet others, it appears monochromatic and wreathed in mist. This close relationship between the material and ethereal planes causes other phenomena. Tenebrious wisps of ectoplasm catch on to tiny impressions of the ethereal plane caused by physical objects passing through it. If a wall, a physical wall of bricks and stuff, is built on the material plane on a world, it can be seen through the roiling ethereal fog. Wait long enough though, and these mists will form into an ethereal duplicate of the wall, 
This wall is only slightly more solid than any other piece of ectoplasm, but it can be seen without having to peer into the material plane. It's right there in front of you. Over time, the ethereal landscape forms, therefore, into a ghostly reflection of the real world. If the real world object were to be destroyed or moved, say if the wall were demolished in the prime material world, then the ethereal duplicate would slowly dissolve back into the free-floating mist. Its template is gone. This process takes some time though, so it's possible to glimpse what the landscape used to look like just by examining the local ethereal plane. The time taken for an ethereal duplicate to form depends on the nature of the object. For example, a character comes across a ruin of a castle with some wooden outbuildings and wishes to learn who once dwelt there. The castle was destroyed on the prime material plane six months ago, but stood there on that site for 60 years prior to its destruction. The ethereal duplicates of the wooden outbuildings around it have long since faded, but the stone structure of the castle itself will endure for five years before dissolving. A character might find duplicate suits of armor or other metal things, but only if their real world counterparts were basically sitting in the same space for at least 12 years, say uh, mounted on a wall or an armor rack or something like that. While exploring, the character finds an ancient shield on the wall bearing the crest of the castle's owner. That answers their question. The real world version of the shield may have long since been shattered or taken away, but its ethereal duplicate still sits and exists for a time. Like items shaped of ectoplasm, ethereal duplicates have little solidity. Pushing through them requires a strength check at a DC equal to the AC of the real world item, so its difficulty class is equal to its armor class. A character might add their wisdom or charisma as a bonus to this, whichever is higher, because they basically will their hand to go through it. Dissolving ethereal duplicates as they slowly dissipate after their real world object is taken away are even less resilient, and you can reduce the DC by 1d10 points. Any magic qualities are properties of a real object or location, never those of an ectoplasmic duplicate, and the duplicates will instantly dissolve away if taken from the ethereal plane to any other plane, including demiplanes. There may be magic that can be developed or exists in alien places far away to exploit these traits, and illusion or conjuration are certainly great examples. More on that in a moment. Really thick swirls and concentrations of the ethereal mist do feel like cold, slightly viscous fog when you're there. When compressed, ectoplasm becomes a clammy grey slime. It can be strained in this form to a liquid that resembles an exceedingly watery oatmeal, a gruel. For example, an ethereal undead could create a sort of house out of the stuff, but it's not exactly robust. It just provides some walls that cover vision or dampen sound, which tends to travel farther and clearer on the ethereal plane thanks to the thickening mist transmitting the vibrations better than just empty air, similar to the way that water transmits sound better and further. Long-term exposure to the mists can cause problems for beings from the planes. For example, the dank mists and chill clinging ectoplasm of the ethereal plane commonly give rise to illnesses. Etheric influenza is the most common of these, where the lungs become partly filled with the ethereal mists that have manifested themselves as something other than oxygen. The ectoplasm of the plane is potable and contains enough moisture to be consumed like water. While ectoplasmic food, though bland, is comprised of enough basic nutrients to subsist on. And I mean subsist. Prolonged reliance on it as the only source of nourishment for a creature not naturalized to the ethereal plane is very detrimental to health. Like trying to live on nothing but water and rice. The lack of vitamins and protein will see the being eventually grow tired, sick and start to suffer a wasting away of muscle, suffer scurvy and any number of other problems before a slow and painful death. It takes considerable practice, skill, and usually some instruction on how to produce better food on the plane. You'll likely hear me refer to this as nutriment. Even the best wizard will end up craving a juicy steak over ectoplasmic tasty wheat, though no matter how much magic is used to describe it. If you hear a distinctive creaking sound around you on the ethereal plane, this is normal. Uh, it's a warning that some spontaneous ethereal coagulation is about to take place. It's caused by the stiffening strands of ectoplasm rubbing against each other. Big areas of coagulation can be a problem because they sort of act like zones of quicksand and the material also blocks anything stuck inside it from attempts to plan a travel, which can be a real danger to creatures from the prime who need food and water to survive. And if totally submerged in it, cutting off the breathable mist means the suffocation is possible. 
Solid ectoplasm drifts like that can remain for well over two weeks in many cases, so it pays to be a little bit wary and see the signs when they show up. The ethereal plane also dulls the senses in general, including the senses of smell and taste, so even normally quite spicy food tastes bland. As a result, some frequent visitors had developed some of the most devastating spices known to gods and men in the entire multiverse. Also, tracking creatures by smell is extremely difficult in the ethereal plane. Alright, let's talk about illusions. The ethereal plane wants to manifest the elemental mists into protomatter and ectoplasm, so spells of abjuration and dismissal or destruction are far more difficult there, while spells of creation are much, much easier to cast and maintain. Illusion spells are all cast at one level higher than they normally would. Saving throws against them are made with a minus one penalty and all illusionary effects can be maintained without requiring the spellcaster to focus their concentration on them, eventually fading away once the spell's normal duration expires. However, there is a 5% chance for every illusion spell cast that the illusion or phantasm takes on a life and reality of its own beyond the spellcaster's control. So, an illusionary wall could become an actual physical obstacle composed of ectoplasm and protomatter, quite real and solid on the ethereal plane with mostly the same traits as a real world prime material wall, or wall on the prime material plane or elemental planes or a protoplane. The illusionary school of magic has quite a lot of creative and diverse spells and the implications of them are mind-boggling when you really get into it. So what happens when someone with blur cast on them has the effect become permanent? Well, a lot of viewers became very excited about the idea of mirror image and the idea that a duplicate of the spell's target is now created and is so real that it is even capable of reproduction. So someone could have a parent that was originally just an illusion. However, there is a catch. Of course there is. Not only, of course, have we got a 5% chance, only a 5% chance that this will happen, but sometimes these illusions that have become real will break free of the spellcaster's control and run amok. The truth is, these duplicates are highly unpredictable in demeanor, alignment, abilities, and even their own final form. Most of the time, such newly created entities aren't hugely different from what the spellcaster originally intended. However, somewhat rarely, these manifested creatures take on aspects that were not intended by the caster at all. There is a cool random roll table you can use in the Guide to the Ethereal Realm, and I'll uh, let me throw that up on the screen here for you. You can have a look. There are two examples in the guidebook. One is the casting of a Phantom Steed spell that unexpectedly manifests uh, permanently. However, this thing can also breathe fire, thanks to being composed of quite a lot of essence of elemental fire from the ethereal mist that comprised its physical form, and it has a tireless and accelerated metabolism which mimics the haste spell. Also, the thing is intelligent and has an undying hatred for the spellcaster and all the caster holds dear. So, far from being a great asset, the thing turns into a real problem pretty much instantly until it's destroyed. Sometimes the manifested illusions are quite handy, granted, but the potential for mayhem is limitless. What happens if a mirror image of the caster with a completely opposing alignment decides it hates the caster so much it's going to cross into the prime material plane and murder someone very important? How does the caster defend themselves against that crime? But think about some of the really nasty illusions such as Phantasmal Killer. The spellcaster taps into the nightmares of a creature that they can see within range and creates an illusionary manifestation of its deepest fears. What could possibly go wrong with that aside from everything real fast? For example, there is one of these things, it's a legendary ethereal monster known only as Fair. This creature wanders the reaches of the deep ethereal, bringing its frightful blessing to any being it encounters. The damn thing is so cunning it is known to employ agents compelled simply by their terror of the creature alone that kidnap more victims and release them for Fair to hunt. Fair was last known to lair among a horde of gruesome trinkets within the massive floating ribcage of a huge dragon that was killed by Fair long ago. Fair possesses all the qualities of the spell, but is also a CR20 creature which could kill anyone who merely looks at it. Up to two creatures who make visual contact with Fair each round must make a DC 20 wisdom saving throw or become frightened until they are no longer within sight of it. 
At the end of each round, while they are frightened due to this effect, they take 5d10 psychic damage. Fair uses this power with some precision, and aside from high intelligence, any other special qualities it has are the subject of much speculation. Thankfully, the ethereal plane is quite misty, so you can lose sight of Fair within 300 feet. The ethereal matter that these manifested creatures and objects are made from, though it can look identical to normal matter, is still protomatter and ectoplasm, so it will break down relatively quickly if it crosses over into a demiplane, elemental plane, or the material plane, lasting only 1d100 hours before evaporating away into mist. Yep, 1d100. So it could vanish in an hour, or up to just over four days, and there is no way to know exactly how long it's got. So an, an intelligent manifested phantasm will most likely only go into the prime material plane or it's any, any other plane, under dire circumstances. The ethereal plane does house a lot of undead, it's true, but most of them cluster around two locations and the main routes taken by the bulk of travelers between the two. That's the border ethereal and the eye. The eye is a gigantic and stunning whirlpool of shining white energy that forms a portal dozens of miles wide that leads to the fugue plane the place where souls go to get sorted and judged before passing on to the afterlife. It was created to gather up all of the errant ghosts that linger there in the ethereal plane and is guarded by four colossal entities known as psychopomps. They are named Ardon, Barris, Chal, and Eska. Surrounding the eye, aside from frequent ether cyclones and storm fronts, are massive shoals of ethereal marauders feeding on the discarded that are sucked into the whirlpool and either other beings crazy enough to get too close. Many do, of course, as this is one of the few ways into the fugue plane that no sane being would ever try to use. Thus, it's quite sneaky. I'll be talking about a few of the undead you can normally encounter in the plane, but listing all the varieties of undead that dwell in the ethereal plane will take me all day. Generally speaking, the more experience you have on the ethereal, the easier it is to sense that an undead entity is nigh nearby. You can kind of feel it. And they are far more common on the border ethereal, not the deep ethereal. The sheer vast expanse of the deep ethereal is both a boon and a curse of it as a location. Finding specific things there is like finding a needle floating somewhere between here and the moon. I know it sounds trite, but in order to navigate the deep ethereal, you really need to know where you are and where you are going before you set out. Otherwise, you are certain to get about as lost as it is possible to get. So vast is the deep ethereal that fresh visitors to it often suffer from a sickening disorientation called ether sickness. The advantage to all this space, though, is, of course, that anyone can very effectively hide anything within it, in plain sight, so to speak, just far, far from anything else that could possibly see it. All right, with those questions out of the way, let's take a overview look at some of the well-known life forms that are either native, newly arrived, or naturalized to the ethereal plane. The most ancient beings are impossibly old. They are some of those who predate the existence of the current prime material plane. There are those who were around when the prime material plane was just referred to as the land, was actually the concordant central plane of the outlands. Some speculate this may be known as the first world, the origin of the major species of sentient life in the multiverse, such as elves and dragons and humans and so on. Take this how you like it. It matters little these days. Only displaced species like the Spellweavers and the Lache really concern themselves with such stuff. There are beings who know what the multiverse was like before gods existed. There are ancient forces of law and order who call the Deep Ethereal and countless magnificent demiplanes their home, such as the Lamazu and the Shadu. Higher ups in this elite club of the mind-bendingly ancient are all very aloof. They have literally seen everything possible, aside from perhaps the end of the multiverse, and they whittle away the eons waiting for the last great event with some anticipation. Most of these races are individuals that have absolutely no fucking interest in talking with younger races at all, ever. What they can be roused into action by is invasive species from the Far Realms, which they do not like but are often so sedate and disengaged that they don't notice something very nasty has arrived unless they are woken up by one of the younger whippersnapper species, at which point they will probably deal with this incursion and then take a mild interest in what is going on in the multiverse before eventually returning to their slumber once again. 
If this sounds a lot like rousing Cthulhu when the stars are right, you're right on the money. Believe me, younger species do not want the Elder Powers rousing from their eternal slumber unless things have really, really gone totally tits up. The solution may save reality, but it may turn out that your civilization, your entire civilization, is just little more than a few spots of nasty mold that has grown on their nice collection of planets that they made a few billion years ago. And they're just going to spend a moment wiping life from the surface of their possessions before they go back to sleep again. Best of luck with the rapid and immediate relocation of your entire species. There are so many creatures in the ethereal, but let's look at them in br well, some of them in brief. Hopefully, I will have more detailed lore videos on each and every one of them on the channel. If you do have any you really want me to cover, do let me know and I'll be putting a list of some order together at some point. Oh, and to everyone who is asking me to make a video on Ethergaunts, I don't really cover Eberron lore and Ethergaunts seem to be served a bit better in Pathfinder lore anyway, but I'll take a look at them in future. Thanks for your requests, I do hear you. The Shadu are related to the Lamazu. Both species are winged and have humanoid-like heads on a body that is either that of a lion or a hoofed creature like a bull in the case of the Shadu. They are collectively known as the Shadim and have been around a long time, so long that they have many sub-races and cultures of their own, more so even than the human species does. Shadu also divide their species further into lesser and greater kinds, which differ dramatically in size. So the lesser Shadu are about the size of a mule, while the greater Shadu are as large as a draft horse. Shadu always wear some sort of headwear, such as a crown or a headband, and always with precious stones set in it, that which displays their rank and status in their society. That's its purpose. Typically stoic and somber, the Shadu are highly intelligent and possess powerful psychic abilities. They can shift into the ethereal plane and project in the astral plane. Most know magic to some extent, and they are very nearly always lawful good in alignment. The Lamazu look very similar to the Shadu, but are smaller, slightly smaller, and they're more commonly found living in isolated ruins and abandoned temples, going about guarding important sites, promoting long-term peace and goodness in the worlds of the Prime Material Plane always stepping up to defend good creatures under attack. Shadim are quite magical in nature, radiating a protective aura, able to cast divine magic and learn arcane spells quite easily, and the inspiration for them is drawn from ancient Sumerian and Arcadian mythology and, myth and monuments. You'll remember seeing these outside of uh, temple entrances. They'll be guarded by two Shadim on either side. I will be uploading a more detailed lore video on them and their role in the ancient history of the Forgotten Realms, particularly in the fall of the creator race known as the Airy Croker. Despite being often in remote, preferably warm areas of the Prime Material Worlds, Shedim are commonly encountered in the Ethereal Plane, so if your characters spend some time there, chances are good that they will encounter some kind of Shedim at some point early on. Memes are actually strange creatures of the Deep Ethereal and they're a self-perpetuating pattern that you use in any nearby material to form their bodies. Sometimes this is quite harmful to any living creatures that get too close to it uh, because it's called an usurpation field. From a distance they appear vaguely like a humanoid moving under the cover of a floating bedsheet with misty edges, a little bit like uh, Pale Knight looks like. Often quite colourful or sort of pale and grey with random swirls and patterns. Close up, within 10 feet, you can see that the meme is composed of a mini vortex that feeds stray particulate matter into the meme's form, and on the other side of both is an exit vortex that sprays out used up material back into the ethereal environment. Memes constantly generate their physical form, so they're quite hardy and regenerative, and tend to hunt along the border ethereal for normal ethereal beings. They can't survive outside the ethereal plane. Thankfully, they're not much of a threat except their curiosity can draw them too close to living beings. And of course, living beings can draw too close to them due to their curiosity, causing something similar to acid damage. Well, similar enough to not make much difference stat-wise. Memes are rare and relatively new, and nobody's sure exactly where they came from. Ghosts and other border lurkers that we are more familiar with, such as the phase spiders, ethereal marauders and ethereal filchers, can be quite a pest alone and very dangerous in groups. Parasites such as thought eaters, zil, devourers, tweens and psychic worms or cerebral parasites can be encountered. 
nasty undead like the apparitions and the devourers are more interested in inflicting horrible suffering on living beings from the elemental and material planes but demi planes are not without their risks so they tend to hang out around border areas Mimedi include a broad variety of lesser spirits. The Mimedi type, named the Gendruo, is the most notorious. They are quite close to what you would call a mischievous, ethereal fey creature, able to take on different appearances at will. They're more interested in pranks than causing real harm. Seen in their natural form on the border ethereal, they appear as a featureless humanoid composed of shimmering multicolored mist, an excellent camouflage for the native environment. On the prime and elemental planes, they often take on a form as someone known to the victim of their prank. And their prank of choice is to grab a victim and simply transport them ethereal plane and stranding them there with no way back. When attacked, their primary defense is the ability to magically generate fear and get away. Nathri are four foot tall humanoids with dark greenish skin and long wild black hair. They wear clothes, use tools, weapons and armor and have their own language and culture roaming the deep ethereal living in large clans numbering up to the hundreds when occasionally they cross the prime plane for hunting or other reasons they are able to naturally see into the border ethereal plane at all times their culture is cleanly divided into the warrior caste or the rogue caste almost all the gear they carry is stolen from their raiding of demi planes and they are some of the best demi plane guides you are likely to find in the deep ethereal they are the inventors of a special spike weapon that they can attach to the back of their hands and keep it dipped in poison. Dower are one of the variety of ethereal oozes you can find. They engulf their prey and may animate or an ingested corpse uh, to give them some sort of a different mobility and hunting options. Dower are relatively new to the ethereal as well, but have made a fearsome reputation for themselves due to the fact that their victims consumed, engulfed and eaten by them, can't be raised from the dead it's unsure why living illusions and offshoots of unique locations such as neth's children neth being one of the uh, a type of living demi plane can be some of the most bizarre interactions and encounters on the plane plus there are a lot of creatures evolved or created elsewhere who now call the ethereal plane home the giant seahorses that were transported to the ethereal to act as the same way that horses do on the prime material and elemental planes They've adapted to the weird medium very quickly since in the other planes that they came from, they're used to moving through bodies of water, so traveling around in three dimensions in the ethereal plane was no biggie to them. Ebon tigers are impressive predators that look like great cats composed entirely of black flame and are capable of crossing into the material and elemental planes and demi planes to hunt, slipping from shadow to shadow, very hard to detect and very nasty in the fight. You can find Massive creatures native to the limitless space of the ethereal. The Kulkrix are gigantic worms, hundreds of feet long, able to project a cone of force that sucks victims into its gullet. They're capable of turning their entire body inside out and teleporting away to avoid harm, such as if somebody's been swallowed and is stabbing them repeatedly, they can turn themselves inside out and disappear. If they do get stranded in another plane, they can't move in the presence of gravity, so they just twitch and flop trying to turn inside out and teleport away but failing to do so until sadly they just perish aerial servants and morden canaan's faithful hound inhabit the ethereal borders let's see foo creatures a dog type and a lion type recently perfectly represented in the marvel movie shang chi and the legend of the ten rings you can see foo creatures there you can find uh, cockatrice basilisks and medusa in the ethereal realms i'll be making videos on so many creatures found here the uh, Gingwatzims, the Giglock, the Magrans, the Furblasts, the Plasms, the Rabians, and the uh, Terethran, and yeah, other creatures. So stay tuned for those. There's many, many ethereal creatures. Going to other planes when a character is still very low level is something I've never flinched away from, and nor should you. After all, you're the DM. You decide what they encounter there, so why not? Running a campaign in the ethereal and how to avoid existential burnout can pose a problem. When players start to understand that their one little world in their crystal sphere in the D&D reality is just a grain of sand in the endless desert of the D&D multiverse. They may cross accidentally into a parallel reality when mind flayers rule worlds or they may constantly be bumping into versions of themselves from other realities and some of those versions may be better than they are. It can get maddening but I can help with that. 
in my next podcasty style episode stay tuned for that remember to post all of your serial questions in the comments down below and i'll be talking with you again very soon and i'll just leave you with this one word to contemplate one of the subjects of our next videos will be ether jammers